Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to another episode in the Deep Learning with TensorFlow series. In this episode, we're going to learn how to classify RGB images using a convolutional neural network. In the last episode, we learned about convolutional neural networks for the very first time, which is really cool. So they're very effective for computer vision tasks, such as image classification. And so last time we built a network that models the LENET5 network, which is one of the very first fundamental networks. But I think it's very important that we get some more practice creating these networks. So I'm going to be teaching you guys how to make a network that can classify RGB images, because last time we learned how to classify only grayscale uh, images of handwritten digits, the MNIST dataset. So this time we're gonna make a CNN classifier for the SciFAR 10 dataset, which is another very popular dataset. So this is a dataset that has 60,000 images, which are 32 by 32. They are RGB, so they have color, and it's split into 10 different classes. That's why it's called SciFAR 10. And then for each of those 10 classes, we have 6,000 images. SciFAR stands for the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. This is a data set that came out in 2009. It's a subset of another really large data set that has 80 million tiny images. So obviously this is much more manageable for what we're doing on our simple little cloud machine here. And yeah, it's split into 50,000 training samples and 10,000 test samples. So 50,000 is a pretty decent number, so we should be able to get something decent with that. As you can see, the images are very small. They're very low resolution, 32 by 32. Uh, but they're split into different classes like airplane, automobile, truck, ship. Uh, they're still pretty uh, distinguishable. You can see that these things are very different. So we're going to try and see if we can build a classifier that can distinguish between the different classes that we have here. There's also another data set called SciFAR 100. And as the name sounds, it's got 100 classes instead of just 10. This one's obviously much larger. So, so that's why we're not going to be using that one for this episode. But you can if you want to, if you can handle that. But in general, I think this is a great way to practice the skills that we learned about last episode so that we can make our second CNN and see if we can achieve some decent results. All right, so the first thing that we're going to do is load the data set from Curious because luckily Curious actually provides it as part of their data sets just because it's such a popular data set. So it makes it easier to import it. So after this piece of code here, after it loads the data, we're just going to print out the shape of the different uh, NumPy arrays that it gives us so we understand what the data is looking like. So let's try it out. Okay, here we go. So it's done downloading. It's very large, as you can see. So it took a second or 11 seconds, rather. So we can see that for training images, the shape is 50,000 by 32 by 32 by 3. So this means we have 50,000 samples to work with. Each of the samples are 32 by 32. But the last one here is going to be the channel, which is 3 because we are using RGB images. If you use something like grayscale images, which we did last episode, it'd be 1, right? Because there's only a single value per pixel. But for RGB images, there's three values per pixel, red, green, and blue. So it's a little more complex. Luckily though, since we're using CNNs, it can handle all that multi-dimensionality just fine. We can keep it as it is. We don't have to reshape or anything like that. So that's really great. And then for the training labels, this is pretty simple as you might expect. We just have 50,000 of them to match however many samples we have for the training images. And then for each of those training images, we have one label. And then for the test ones, we have 10,000 and 10,000. So makes sense, I think. So 50,000 training samples and 10,000 test samples, which is good. Let's also go ahead and visualize what a single sample might look like. I have no idea what this is because it's so small in terms of resolution. It kind of looks like a little turd or, or like a crab or something like that. So let's go ahead and print out the label as well. All we did was use a uh, matplotlib and just plotted using the image show function and just selected the first sample. So we'll just print out the actual label for that. So train labels zero. So we get six, so this means that it's class six. It's probably zero based, so it'd probably be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's frog, which I think makes sense. That looks kind of like a frog, very vaguely. That's his little legs and stuff. So that's a frog, okay, cool. So now that we have obtained our data set, the thing that we would want to do next usually is pre-process it. Um, but since we're using a CNN, the only thing that we need to do is really just normalize the data to make sure that it's in a scale like zero to one for each pixel, because currently each of the RGB numbers can range from like zero to 255, for example. So commonly what you would do, and we've been doing this throughout the series when we work with images, is you want to rescale it to a normal range, which is zero to one. And this makes it so that the neural network is more effective because it likes smaller numbers. The cool thing though is that we learned that we can just directly add a layer to our network architecture and it will handle that for us. So let's start by building our network. We'll do model is equal to curious.sequential. So first we're going to define the shape of our input. So that's always good to do. So you have a good picture of what's going on. So we know it's going to be 32 by 32 images. And then for each of those pixels, like we learned, there's going to be three values for RGB. And then after that, we want to rescale it like I just mentioned. So that's just going to put the values in that rescaled range. So curious.layers.rescaling. And we'll do one point divided by 255. 
So this will make it so that we convert each pixel value to a floating point number and also divide it by 255. So now they're going to be rescaled for us. So that's it for the pre-processing. That's going to handle all of that for us automatically. Luckily, it's not too much we have to do for this specific data set, but in the future, you might have to do a lot more, of course. But now we learned that there's two parts to a convolutional neural network. You have the convolutional part, and then you have the fully connected part, okay? So this convolutional part is going to be made of our convolutional layers and our pooling layers, and then the fully connected part will be made of our standard dense layers. So this part will handle the understanding of the images, like understanding what the features are and uh, starting to recognize them. And then this part will actually handle the classification. So let's start by adding a convolutional layer. So keras.layers.conv2d. First, we need to define the features, the amount of features that we want to have in this convolutional layer. So we'll do 32. We also want to specify our kernel size, which is the size of each filter. So we'll do three by three, that's a common size. And then we can also do an activation that is applied to the feature map afterwards, which is ReLU. And then if you want to, this is not required, but you can specify the padding to either valid padding or same padding. Hopefully you remember what this is, but if you have same padding, this means that each image that goes through this convolutional layer will come out with the same spatial dimensions. So 32 by 32. And then if you have valid padding, this means no padding. So this means that the size, the spatial dimensions of the images will shrink most likely. So we'll just leave it on the default, which is valid padding. And always remember, since we're using a sequential model, we can go ahead and view a summary of it so we can understand just how the data is flowing throughout the model. So first we have a rescaling layer. So 32, 32, three, that's the output shape. And then when it goes to that first convolutional layer, we have an output shape of 30 by 30, which is because of the valid padding that I just told you about. And then the channel changes from three to 32 because the number of filters will dictate that last channel dimension. All right, so that's our first convolutional layer. And then commonly when you have these layers, you usually want to follow them with a max pooling layer or an average pooling layer. But max pooling is more popular nowadays. So we'll do curious.layers.maxpooling 2D. And then now we want to specify a pool size, which is the size of basically the filter that is going to be used for the pooling layer. So it's going to have a window of two by two, and it's going to slide over the input and get the max of each window basically, right? And then we're going to do strides to also we're going to be two by two. So these are just standard numbers, two by two and two by two. Um, all this will do is basically have the spatial dimensions of the output of the previous layer. So if we rerun it, the summary explains that perfectly. So we go from 30 by 30 by 32. And then when it goes to the max pooling layer, we get 15 by 15 by 32. Okay, so let's go in and just take this and just copy and paste a few times. So we'll have three convolutional layers followed by max pooling layers. In terms of the number of filters, usually with a convolutional network, you want to have them ascending instead of descending with like with dense layers. So what I'll do is just change this from like, I don't know, 16 to 32 to 64. And we'll see what that gives us. Again, these numbers are just kind of a guess, right? Until you figure out how your model is performing and then you can adjust them later, of course, right? So now we want to do the fully connected part. But if you remember though, um, this is not going to work currently with the output of the max pooling layer. We have two by two by 64, but our fully connected layers require input to be flattened to a single vector. So we just want to add in our flattened layer, which will handle that. So curious.layers.flatten. We go from two by two to 64 to 256. So it's just simply multiplying each of these together to get this number here. So now we can actually feed that through the classifier part. So we'll do a dense layer. So curious.layers.dense and we'll do 256 units, which is the number of neurons, and then we'll do an activation of ReLU. And then we can do curious.layers.dense units, we'll say 10 units, and this is gonna be our output layer, so we wanna have an activation of, hopefully you can tell me which one it is, it's gonna be softmax because we are doing a single label multi-class classification problem, so we're predicting one of 10 different classes, so that's why we're gonna use softmax. If it was a binary classification problem, it would be sigmoid. So here's our compilation. We're using an optimizer of atom, a loss of sparse categorical cross entropy because we're not doing one hot encoding for the labels, and then the metrics will do accuracy. Here's our final summary. So we're gonna have a total parameter count of 91,000 or almost 92,000. If any of this is confusing, then just make sure to go back to last episode and go over the different parts, okay? One thing I'm gonna add is just a callback that will do early stopping just so that if it starts overfitting, it'll just stop it so we don't have to waste time, right? So now to train it, we'll do history is equal to model.fit. Now we want to pass in our training images and then our training labels and then we'll do 50 epochs and then we'll do our standard validation split of 20 percent all right so let's go ahead and run it and see what happens all right it's done training so we've made a 212 epochs so let's take a look at what that looks like in terms of the training loss and validation loss and the accuracy so we can see that we have pretty 
decent results, not like the best. We are in between 70% and 65% in terms of the accuracy, the validation accuracy. Um, this is actually pretty expected for a simple CNN for this specific data set, the Cy410 data set. Um, people usually get results about 70% without any advanced techniques or anything like that. We're going to learn how we can get a better number for this, of course. But for now, this is pretty decent. This is pretty expected. Um, the validation loss stops just under one, it looks like. So here we go. Yeah, we get a test accuracy of 67% and a test loss of just under one. Now I advise that you pause the video and I want you to try just playing around with your model architectures. So let me scroll up here. Just go ahead and try, you know, removing layers, adding layers, changing the number of filters, changing the dense part as well. Maybe add some dropout, some regularization, stuff like that. Just see what you can do to push out better results from this model and then come back, okay? One thing that I noticed is that it starts to overfit pretty quickly. So I think this is a great opportunity to show you guys what happens when we add dropout to this because I think one, it's important to show you how you can add dropout to, to a CNN, but also just showing you the effect of dropout on an actual a network that we're training for the first time on a new data set. So again, the point of dropout is to fight overfitting by disabling certain neurons to make them less reliant on one another and generalize better. So, so let's see if we can actually see that when we add our dropout. So let's go back up to the top here. And to add dropout, the first thing you have to know is that you don't usually add it to the convolutional part. Usually you'll add dropout to the fully connected part. So for example, we can actually add it directly after the flatten layer. Even though there's not a dense layer here, we can still add it here. So we can do kiras.layers.dropout and let's set it to a number, a rate of like 0.3, so 30%, and add it as well after our dense layer. We'll set that one to 30% as well, okay? So what I'll do is copy this image into a new tab, and then we'll run this again and see what that looks like. All right, here we go. So as you can see right away, I don't even have to pull up the other one, the previous one. This is looking a lot better. You can see that it's a lot smoother as you can see. It's gradually decreasing the validation and training loss. And then you can also notice that it takes a lot longer. So we went from about 12 epochs to tw over 20 epochs. It took a lot more time to learn than before, so that's great. But just because it's taking more time doesn't mean it's necessarily a, a better thing. You can see that the validation loss is smaller than it was before. It was just under one, but now it's, I would say, probably under 90%. We'll, we'll check in a second. And then the training and validation accuracy, you can see is a much better picture as well. We pushed it from about, I don't know, 67% to a little just under or maybe just above 70%. So a slight increase, but still an increase nevertheless. All we did was add two dropout layers and it had this effect. I think that's actually really cool because when you first learn about stuff like dropout or L1 and L2, it may be like, I don't know how to actually use it and apply it and see the results. I don't know, that's kind of how I feel, but being able to add it to this network that we just built here and seeing the results right away, I think makes it a lot more clear on how it's helpful because we delayed overfitting by making so that it takes more time to learn. And also when it took that more time, it learned a little bit better. And then if we scroll down, we can see that we have a test accuracy of 70%, which is better than before. And then a much better test loss of 0.84, which is great. Let's see what happens if we up the dropout just a little bit. We'll change this one, for example, from 0.3 to 0.5 and see if anything changes. Okay, so just looking at our results here, we can see that not much of a change happened. We went, you know, for one more epoch than last time. And also our test results are pretty much the exact same. So 70% and then 0.85. So just changing that one little value didn't really have much of an effect. Obviously, it's something that you would need to tweak and just play with even more. But one other thing that we'll try is just changing the number of filters in our convolutional layers. And let's just see how that affects our training process as well. As we learned about before, um, increasing the complexity of your architecture could have two effects. It can make overfitting happen more. So maybe adding more dropout would help that. But also at the same time, increasing the complexity of your model could make it learn better. So it's as we learned, it's a trade-off, right? So let's just see. If we increase it to double what it currently is for each filter amount, let's just see what that does. So 32, 64, and 128, let's try it out. So we can see that we have a slightly smaller number of epochs that it took to learn before it started overfitting. So this could be, of course, because we increased the complexity of the model, so it overfits a little harder, I guess. But if we take a look at our accuracy, we see that because we increased the complexity, it learned better. So if you scroll down, we can see now that we have a test accuracy of almost 73% which is even better, and then an even better test loss of 0.77. Amazing, so now you can see that all the concepts that we learned so far, like adding regularization with dropout, um, increasing or decreasing the complexity of your model, how that actually affects the training process on a data set that you've never seen before, which is Cypher 10. So let me know if you found this helpful yourself. And that's it for this episode, guys. I just wanted to show you guys how to make a convolutional neural network to train on RGB images so that you can get some more practice. So that's it for this video, everybody. I really hope you learned something new. 
If you liked the video, please hit the like button, and if you want to see more, hit that subscribe button. Make sure to also check the description below for important links to code and other resources, but also really important, join our Discord. We have a big community of over 5,000 programmers, and it's a place where you can find new friends or get help on any code that you're stuck on. If you want to support what I do on this channel, please consider hitting the join button below, and this will allow you to support my channel for as low as $1 a month, but there are different tiers to choose from if you want to. For anyone that becomes a member on my channel, you get a special rank on my Discord server, early access to new videos and you could just see yourself on the screen right now so if that sounds cool to you feel free to join if you don't want to that's fine if you can't that's okay too i really just appreciate you watching the video anyway thank you so much and that's it peace